lot of books, pamphlets, technical papers, and official regulations have been written on the subject of vehicle safety and periodic vehicle inspection. As a matter of fact, so much has been written and said that it's hard to figure out just what a good safety inspection should include. That's where this fella comes in. His name is Roy Hayden, and what he doesn't know about making sure a vehicle is safe for the road isn't worth knowing. <laughs> well, after that flattering introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say on the subject. But seriously, I do have a set of slides here that I use to explain to service managers, service technicians, and owners, for that matter, mechanical items that safety authorities agree are essential to safe vehicle condition. But before I get into a discussion of the technical details of periodic vehicle inspection, I'd like to tell you why those of us that are closely associated with vehicle safety think everyone should be interested in and should get behind periodic vehicle inspection. The purpose of periodic motor vehicle inspection is to discover unsafe vehicle conditions that might contribute to an accident, and by removing these conditions, to prevent an accident. There are plenty of good reasons why everyone from car manufacturers to housewives should be concerned about periodic motor vehicle inspection. The car manufacturer is vitally concerned about safe vehicles because this aspect of highway safety is essential to the very future of the automobile industry. But designing and building safe cars isn't enough. Every vehicle on the highway must be maintained in safe operating condition. Of course, it is the owner's responsibility to maintain his car in safe operating condition. But it sometimes seems to me that the durability, dependability, and trouble-free performance built into today's cars lulls some owners into neglecting periodic maintenance. I sure agree with that, Roy. Because of design improvements like automatic brake adjusters, greatly extended lube periods, and more miles between oil changes, it's pretty easy for an owner to neglect his car as long as it seems to be running all right. Exactly, Tech. And that's why anything your dealers and master technicians can do to help educate owners on the importance of periodic vehicle inspection is bound to go a long way toward promoting safety on our highways. As a group, your master technicians already know more about cars than just about anyone else. And I think our discussion today will give them an even better understanding of what periodic vehicle inspection is all about, so they'll be better equipped to make sure every car they work on is safe for the road. Equally important, a service technician can do a lot outside of working hours to promote the cause of periodic vehicle inspection. Since he is generally recognized as an automotive expert, his friends and neighbors are willing to listen to what he has to say on the subject of car safety. And now, I think it's high time I got around to explaining the inspection items that are considered essential to safe vehicle condition. I'll take it from the ground up, starting with tires. When is a tire considered unsafe for the road? Any tire with a tread cut or snag that is more than one inch long and deep enough to expose the cords is definitely unsafe. The same thing goes for a tire having a bump, bulge, or knot that appears to be caused by tread or sidewall separation. A tire that is worn so that the cord is exposed at any point is unsafe. When a tire is worn so that the depth of any two adjacent tread grooves is less than one sixteenth of an inch, it isn't safe for the road. If only one tread groove is too shallow, the tire may be safe, but you better question suspension alignment or the way the driver takes the corners. Incidentally, any tire that has been re-grooved or re-cut below the original groove depth is considered unsafe. An exception to this is special commercial tires that have extra tread rubber specifically designed to allow re-grooving. Tires having tread wear indicators are unsafe when they wear down to the point where two or more of the tread grooves are completely worn off in the area of the tread wear indicators. Tire pressure has a direct bearing on safety because incorrect pressure affects handling. And of course, low or excessively high tire pressure reduces tire life. Far too many owners don't pay enough attention to tire pressure and tire rotation recommendations. They don't realize that pressure recommendations aren't the same for all body models 
and higher pressures are usually recommended for heavy loads and sustained high-speed driving. Very good points, Tech. Loose, missing, or damaged wheel studs, nuts, or lugs are dangerous. So is a wheel that is bent, cracked, or has been damaged and repaired by welding. Don't fool around with damaged wheels. Next on my list is steering. The relationship of steering to safe vehicle condition is pretty obvious. However, how you determine what is and what isn't safe calls for a little clarification and discussion. The steering system should be tested and inspected to make sure it's not worn or damaged. A car shouldn't be on the road if the linkage binds or jams at any point when you turn the wheel from full right and left or if the linkage has excessive free play. Wear and adjustment of the steering system can be checked by measuring lash or free play. More than two inches free play measured at the steering wheel rim with the wheels in the straight ahead position means steering trouble. On cars equipped with power steering, the engine should be running when checking free play. And inspect the power steering pump drive belt to make sure it isn't loose or badly worn. Starting with the 1967 models, all vehicles have been equipped with the energy absorbing steering column. A close inspection of the entire assembly is called for if there's any evidence of damage. If the column support bracket has moved forward, shearing the mounting capsules, the steering shaft and shift tube are usually damaged too. Damage to the shift tube will be obvious because it will interfere with gear selection. To test the steering shaft pins, grasp the lower end of the shaft and try to move it up and down. Any up and down movement means the plastic pins have sheared. If the steering shaft pins shear, the vehicle can still be controlled. But steering will be sloppy and the steering shaft should be replaced. Oh, incidentally, any rough treatment of the column assembly in or out of the vehicle can shear those steering shaft pins. There's more about this in the reference book, Roy. So why don't you move on to steering linkage inspection? Good idea, Tech. You have to lift the vehicle off the floor to check the steering linkage for worn or damaged parts. How you lift the front of the car is important because the front suspension ball joints must be under load when making this inspection. On Chrysler built cars, that means lifting the vehicle by front suspension cross member or the frame. The upper control arm will rest against the rebound bumper and the torsion bar will keep both ball joints under load. Steering linkage free play can be checked by grabbing the front and rear of the tire and trying to turn the wheel to the left and to the right. More than a quarter of an inch movement is too much and you'll have to inspect the entire linkage to find out what's loose or worn. Just make sure the looseness isn't in the wheel bearings. You can check for loose wheel bearings by grabbing the tire top and bottom and working it in and out. Any noticeable movement between brake drum and backing plate is too much. It's desirable to check front wheel alignment periodically to avoid rapid tire wear and undesirable handling and steering characteristics. Since front wheel alignment is quite a story, you hit the highlights and I'll put the details in the reference book. Wheel toe should be checked because too much toe causes rapid tire wear. Where a side slip indicator is used to check toe, more than 30 feet per mile of side slip is considered excessive. The important thing to remember is that a car will easily pass the side slip test if toe is within specifications. Caster and camber affect handling, and for this reason, they should be checked periodically. There are just a couple of points I'd like to get in here, Roy. Front suspension height must be correct before checking or adjusting front end alignment. On our cars, it's easy to adjust front suspension height. But I want our technicians to remember to recheck caster and camber any time they adjust height. Also, headlight aiming should be checked whenever front suspension height is changed. I know you're going to cover lights later on, Roy, but I wanted to get that plug in here. Last month, we talked about the importance of making sure a car had the correct torsion bars installed. That means the correct part number and bar for the car you're working on. The bar with a part number ending in an odd digit on the left side, even digit on the right side. And now, 
If someone will turn the record, we'll clear up some common misunderstanding about ball joints and ball joint wear. On all Chrysler built cars, the upper ball joint is simply a pivot point for the steering knuckle and maintains steering alignment. The lower ball joint carries the front suspension load. On all models except Imperials, the lower ball joint is not a preloaded joint. That doesn't mean it's loose under operating conditions. It is always loaded when the car's on the road. As a matter of fact, when a wheel drops into a chuck hole, the tire and wheel tries to drop down and unload the lower joint. However, the torsion bar can move the lower control arm faster than gravity can move the wheel. So the lower joint is always loaded, even under pretty rough operating conditions. Those are very good points, Tech, and I'm glad you cleared them up. It'll make it easier for me to explain the recommended ball joint inspection procedure. Ball joints can be inspected for wear only when they're unloaded. On Chrysler-built cars, that means the vehicle must be lifted at the lower control arm. Remember, this is the opposite of the way the vehicle is lifted to inspect for steering linkage free play. Install safety floor stands under both lower control arms. Stands should be placed as far outboard as possible so that the car will be stable. The upper control arms must not contact the rebound bumpers. On all models built prior to 1968, except Imperials having a pre-loaded lower ball joint, vertical movement between the ball and its socket must not be more than 50 thousandths. The specification for 1968 models, except Imperial, is 70 thousandths. The dial indicator method is the only valid way of determining lower ball joint wear on Chrysler built vehicles. You can't accurately determine lower ball joint wear by measuring horizontal movement at the bottom of the tire tread. Upper ball joints and preloaded lower ball joints on Imperial are another story. Right you are, Tech. Pre-loaded ball joints should have no detectable free play in any direction. This applies to the pre-loaded upper ball joints on all models and the lower ball joints on 67 and 68 Imperials. Front suspension inspection should include the shock absorbers, shock absorber mountings, lower control arm strut attachments, and all steering and suspension seals. Rear suspension inspections should include shock absorbers, spring leaves, spring clips, U-bolts, and spring shackles. The installation of unauthorized springs or other suspension devices is frowned upon, particularly if it throws the front end geometry off and affects steering and handling. Anyone that has to beef up the rear suspension to handle heavier loads should not use unauthorized or incorrectly installed heavy-duty equipment. And that should just about bring us up to a most important subject, brakes. Right you are, Tech. Complete brake testing would just about fill a Tech film. So I'll stick to the highlights of checking out the hydraulic system, actual brake performance, and lining and drum inspection. Simply testing brake pedal travel under moderate foot pressure provides a quick and meaningful test of hydraulic system condition. Pedal travel shouldn't be more than about two-thirds of total travel available. The pedal must hold without any movement or creep. One of the ways of checking overall brake performance is to test the brakes on a dry, smooth, hard surface that's entirely free of oil, grease, or loose material. From a speed of 20 miles an hour, the car must stop within 25 feet after the brakes are applied. In addition, the vehicle must not swerve to the left or right far enough to go out of bounds on a 12-foot wide test lane. In other words, it must be a reasonably straight line stop without skidding sidewise. Brake performance can also be tested using any one of several approved types of brake testing equipment. A detailed discussion of the recommended brake performance codes would take the rest of this film and then some. So let's go on to some of the important visual and mechanical inspections. Since automatic brake adjusters maintain pedal height by compensating for lining wear, regular periodic inspection of brake shoes is very important. On drum type brakes, this can only be done by removing one front and one rear brake drum. 
Chrysler recommends that this be done every 12,000 miles. That's a good recommendation, Tech. Now, when you have a drum off, be sure to inspect anchor pins, shoe return springs, backing plate platforms, and automatic adjusters. The minimum acceptable lining thickness for bonded linings is 1 32nd of an inch at the thinnest point. This applies to both disc and drum type brakes. A word of caution about that 1 32nd specification. Anytime you find the lining on one of your customer's cars down to 1 32nd of an inch, you ought to warn him that he'll soon need a reline job and put his name in the follow-up file. That's a good suggestion, Tech. Linings must be free of oil, grease, or other contaminants that would affect braking. Minor lengthwise lining cracks aren't serious, providing the lining isn't loose and the cracks don't extend across the shoe. Brake drums and brake discs should also be inspected. Normal wear and minor grooves do not materially affect braking as long as the braking surface is smooth. Rough or damaged surfaces or cracks that extend as far as an edge mean the drum or disc must be replaced. Hydraulic system inspections should include wheel cylinders for leakage, hydraulic hoses and connections for damage or leakage, and master cylinder fluid level. There are a few items I'd like to add before we get off the subject of brakes. On cars that are equipped with power brakes, inspect the vacuum hoses, the hose clamps. Make sure the air filter isn't clogged and make sure the power assist is working and the system isn't leaking. The parking brake and brake warning light should be tested periodically. The parking brake should hold without using up all of the available pedal or lever apply travel. The brake must hold on a 30% grade, car headed up or down grade. Check out the brake warning light by applying the parking brake with the ignition on. This will tell you the warning light bulb is okay. To test the hydraulic system, release the parking brake. Apply the service brakes, and the warning light should remain off. And that brings us to another very important safety subject, lights and signals. This light brakes could fill up half a film if we tried to cover all of the inspection recommendations and specifications. So suppose you stick to the high points, Roy. Okay, Tech. Any missing, burned out, or inoperative light could constitute a serious highway safety hazard. That's why it's so important to test the operation of every light required for safety. Do your customers a favor and make sure the license plate light works. It'll save them a traffic ticket. It's impossible to overemphasize the importance of correct headlight aiming. Headlight aiming should be checked every six months, sooner if front end height has been altered or the front end has been damaged. Defective or improperly aimed headlights spell safety trouble. Headlight aiming can be tested by using an inspection screen. This is set up on a smooth, level floor, 25 feet in front of the car lights. Of course, mechanical headlight aimers can also be used. Just be sure your headlight aiming equipment is in good working condition and correctly used. Even the horn is classified as safety equipment, isn't it? That it is, Tech. According to safety recommendations, you should be able to hear the horn from a distance of at least 200 feet. All glass must be in good condition and of an approved type. Cracks, discoloration, or stickers that obscure vision as well as sharp edges are considered unsafe. This applies to windshields, side windows, and rear windows. Incidentally, if the vision to the rear of the vehicle through the rear window is obscured, an outside mirror that will provide good visibility to the rear is required. On the subject of visibility, the effectiveness of the windshield wipers and washers is important to safety. Not only must the blades and arms be in good condition, the wipers must pass an actual wipe test. Any body, sheet metal, or trim condition that is considered hazardous to occupants, pedestrians, or other vehicles makes the vehicle unsafe for the road. The entire exhaust system must be in good condition and free from exhaust gas leaks. Also, all openings or holes in the underbody that would allow gas to enter should be sealed. Last but certainly not least are the lap and shoulder belts. 
buckles must latch and unlatch easily and be readily adjustable. This inspection should include the condition of buckles, webbing, and all anchors. We time that out right down to the wire, Roy. I sure want to thank you and only wish every owner could see your safety slides. And now, I hope that every one of you master technicians out there will do your part to make sure the cars you work on are safe for the road. I'm sure we are all going to hear more and more about periodic vehicle inspection. One way or another, we must keep unsafe vehicles off the roads. You might say, today's film sort of casts a shadow of things to come. So think safety, and I'll see you all next month. Thank you.